So with the payroll taxes, you have to meet certain days. And sometimes you have to meet some qualifications. If your payroll is under a certain amount, you might not need to pay your payroll taxes every month. If it's a large amount, you might have to do it every month. Or you might even have to do it weekly. It just depends on what time of a, type of a client that you are. But in many businesses, they send their payroll out to a payroll company to process their payroll. Your employees will take their payroll very personal. So if you make a mistake with their payroll, they're going to be upset. So in order to eliminate some of that stress on the people that are doing the payroll, a lot of times we send that payroll out to a payroll company. You still have to phone in or email how many hours everybody worked, whether they had leave, all of that information, but someone else is going to process that and then either process the checks or make the electronic funds transfer for that payroll. I don't get a check here anymore. Everybody's money goes directly to the bank. It's all electronically uh, processed. I don't even get a pay stub anymore. If I want a copy of the pay stub, I have to log on to print one off. I just usually log in to make sure it's okay. I don't save it. Um, but in order to, I guess to, to take some of the stress off of your employees, like I said, a lot of companies are sending their payroll out to a payroll company. Now, we're going to spend two chapters on payroll. We'll know a little bit about payroll, but there's an entire class on payroll that goes for 16 weeks. So we're not going to know everything about payroll. I'm going to try to cram in what we'll learn uh, in those two weeks as we work through seven and eight. But there's more to payroll than just what we're going to be covering. I have some students that will discover uh, during these two chapters that they never, ever, ever want to do payroll in their business. And then I have some students that say, I think this is what I want to do. I want to be a payroll clerk. I want to do payroll. Somebody has to do it. And I've had two students just this semester, after taking the 16-week payroll class, that have decided that's the way they want to go. They want to do payroll. I don't think I want to do payroll every week. I don't mind the two chapters, but I don't think I could do it every week. I really don't. I don't think I could work for a payroll company. I could probably gather the information and send it in and be the contact person for the employees, but I don't think I'd like to be responsible for what gets deposited or what check gets cut. I don't think I'd want that. If somebody's payroll is not correct, I don't think I could take the heat. So, anyway, well, what we're going to cover in these chapters, we're going to calculate the gross pay, and when we talk about gross, what does that mean? before we've taken anything out. That's the total amount that you've earned. The employee payroll tax deductions for the federal income tax withholding, state income tax withholding, the FICA, which is the OASDI Medicare, and then the net pay. After we subtract all of that, then we'll come up with the net. That is what the employee is responsible for. Then we have taxes that the employer will be responsible for, the people that we work for. Calculating the employer taxes for FICA, and the employer has to match what the employee has had taken out of their check. The federal uh, unemployment tax and the state unemployment tax workers' compensation. We'll be preparing a payroll register. It gets busy, it gets filled up with lots of numbers, has lots of columns and lots of totals, and then maintaining the employee earnings record. And that's a form that we'll have for each one of our employees. So number one, we have what the employees are paying. Number two, we have what the employers are paying. The payroll is just a business event that occurs in a business. It could either be weekly, 
Some places are paid um, every Friday, some are paid every other Friday, some are paid twice a month. We get paid on the 15th and the 30th year. doesn't have to be the 15th or the 30th. It could be the 12th and the 24th, as long as you're consistent. Uh, we have to have payroll, whether it's a small business or a major business. Someone needs to know how to calculate that and record it. And then we have to be aware of what those rules are for payment and for what the percentages are. Again, I'm not going to test you on what percentage are we going to use for those taxes. I want you just to take that from the problems or to take it from the numbers that I give you. Don't, don't worry with trying to memorize those. The payroll process, we're going to use the payroll register to calculate what is withheld to come up with the net pay. We'll have the taxes, but we also can have some other things that are taken out of the employee's check. It could be parking, it could be a garnishment, it could be insurance payment that they're making. What else is taken out of there? It could be, um, I pay a certain amount each month to go towards a medical card, like a credit card that I can use, and that money's taken out before taxes. Um, what else could you have taken out that's there? Your insurance, it could be a savings, it could be a 401. I mean, there's just lots of different things. Um, employee profit sharing. It could be, it just could be a number of things. You have to elect what you're going to have taken out of your check. And sometimes there's an enrollment period. Ours is always before that first period um, when we come back in August that we have an open enrollment. So you could either change things with your insurance or you could change the amount that you want to have taken out for savings. I used to have, um, when I worked at the bank in Virginia, we had lunch served every Wednesday and we could have that taken out of our check. We could have our parking taken out of our check. So it's just a number of different things that you can have withheld from your check. We're going to calculate and pay the employer payroll. That's the second box. Record the payroll, payroll taxes, and payment of payroll and payroll taxes. Post, we'll never get away from that. Report the payroll and payroll taxes on the financial statements. And then we have report the payroll and payroll taxes and prepare the W-2 and the W-3 over there on the right and report the payroll and payroll taxes and do a 941 quarterly or a 940 EZ. And we'll do some of those forms together. We'll do those in class. So to calculate, number one, you have to be accurate. People take their payroll the amount of, of money that they earn each month or each week, very personal. So if there's a mistake, they're not going to be happy. It has to be on time. Employees need to get their checks, and the government needs to receive their taxes. We don't want to have uh, our business closed because we're not making those dates. We must obey the law, <coughs> and payroll is confidential. Again, the bank where I worked in Virginia, if you were caught discussing salaries, you could do that go from your job. So it is supposed to be confidential. When we talk about how our employees are paid, we can have an hourly worker. And when we talk about hourly, um, what is the term that we would use for hourly when we were making the, the payroll wages. And you notice when we were making some of those entries in the, the previous chapters, we had wages and we had salaries. We can also have employees that are salary workers and they're earning the same amount every month or every week. The pay period can start on any day of the week and must end after the specified period of time. We could be paid daily, weekly, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, 
monthly, quarterly, or annually. I would not want to be paid annually, but you could. And we can use different pay periods for different groups of people. Here at Alamo Colleges, um, we used to be able to elect to get paid for 12 months. That was always an option instead of just our eight-month contract. I always choose to get, have it divided by 12. Starting in August, there's not going to be a choice. Everybody's going to get paid for 12 months. So I think it will make it easier. Everybody has to go to it. Yeah, 12 months. So your, your check is less, but it's not, it's not the fast during the summer when there's no check coming in. Or even during the month of December, there's not a check that comes in if you're on the eight month contract. Again, you can pay just eight months. So everybody's going to be on the 12 month. I think it will make it easier for payroll because they had to do two separate ones the ones that chose to get paid every month and the ones that stayed on the eight month contract. It has a lot to do with. Um, your insurance payment too, because before you leave in May, then all of that insurance for June, July, and August are taken out of that last month's check. So I think it's just going to make it a little bit easier for the payroll department. But it can't start any day of the week. When we talk about regular earnings, that would be your hourly rate or your salary. If you are working overtime, some businesses will calculate their overtime if it's more than eight hours in a day. Some will calculate your overtime if it's more than 40 hours in a week. And there's a big difference there. Um, I've had a lot of my students to work at HEB, and sometimes they keep you right at 38 or 39, <laughs> yeah. so you don't get any overtime. Um, they don't. So you have to be compensated. It's not usually overtime. If I work more than 40 hours in a week, no, I don't get any more. No. Um, usually, when it's a salaried worker, you know exactly what you need to be doing and however long it takes you to do it, that's, that's how we define it. So you're more like a captive contractor if you're selling. Right, right. You're paid for but, a specific task and you're paid to do the task, not to do that. But I remember, and this was the same bank where I worked in Virginia, we had a lot of trainees that were coming in to be loan officers, and they were salary. And we worked them more than 40 hours, and some of them got together and filed a complaint with the bank, and they were compensated. You know, they had been tracking how many hours they've been working. You're not supposed to be working more than 40 hours a week, so they have to, they're supposed to compensate you. Now, I've had students to say, I don't even get a lunch break. Do they have to give you a lunch break? But I don't know that you have to. I had a student that was working at like the Dollar General or Family Dollar or something, and we did some research to see if she was entitled to a lunch. I don't remember what her shift was. It might have been five hours. And if it's under six, you're not entitled to lunch. Oh, yeah. You're not entitled to a break. Right. At eight, yes. You probably even have some breaks in there, too. Plus, if you're the owner of a business, how productive are your employees if you are just work, 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 and no breaks? Right. You've got to, you have to treat your employees fairly. You have to be kind. You just can't have be a workforce and just work, work, work with absolutely no break. I don't ever take lunch, but I eat lunch in my office. I'm usually there, which is probably terrible. It would probably be better if I would come to the conference room and actually eat lunch. But I just usually grab something and I don't take a lunch. If my work's not done, then I have to stay longer to get it done. You know, 
know, there's really no any download day for me. Um, yeah. Back to the salary thing. Yes. So if you're on a salary, basically it's your responsibility not to work for over 40 hours. I would keep track of it. I used to write down every time what time I got to school and what time I left. I don't. <coughs> excuse me. I don't do that anymore um, because I know I'm here a lot. But there are some faculty in this department and in the business department that say I only need to be here ten hours a week. That's my office hours, and that's all they're here. That's all they're here. Now our president says we're supposed to be here forty hours a week. Does that happen? Yeah. I mean, there are some people that are here probably 40 hours or more a week. I, I don't want to take my work home. I can't, but I'd rather not. I usually just come in. When I used to work, my, I used to work on days that we career, and they used to give me comp time. So they would overwork you, and then later in the future, just be like, oh, you have, 10, you have 20 hours comp time. You can take two hours off today. Is that? Well, it depends on how that contract was that you signed with the pledge of work there. I wasn't out. I was waived. I was out. Okay. And they didn't want to pay you overtime. Yeah, so they would make us work like four, like 50 hours a week. And they're like, oh, you have 10 hours comp time. So they would just let me go home early one day or something like that. But they would spread it out. So it's basically like, you don't even really know. So yeah. they would like send me home like 30 minutes early one day. Like 30 minutes earlier than I see. And when you, you're on a job interview, and those are the types of questions that you need to be asking. How is that salary calculated? You know, how are they don't want to pay overtime? If you're the owner of a business, if you're paying overtime, what happens to your expenses? Yeah. Well, it depends on what Jennifer agreed to when she was hired. I didn't know is it was it legal? It was my first job. So I don't know, know but it's... Uh, does that with like law enforcement organizations? They do the same well, thing. Yeah. 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 But yeah. if you <laughs> fought it, Sharon, what happens? What could happen? Yeah, you could just be like, oh. So they it's... We don't ask the questions in the first place. Like, it's kind of your fault for not knowing. Well, I'm not trying to sound like me, but that's kind of, kind of is, I guess. You just, sometimes I think you just assume that your employer is going to treat you fairly, but they don't always. Now, when we come back here and we talk about our president now saying that we're all supposed to be here 40 hours a week, what were they told when they were hired? Whoever was on the contract that they signed. Well, we sign a new contract about every five years. But what was on there? We have 10 hours of office hours. How would you take that? Some people are taking it. That's all I have to do. My classes are online. I have virtual office hours. <laughs> Some people do have virtual office hours. Remember, I've told you I got my master's degree online. I never went to class. And there were times when the instructor was available to discuss things with or I could chat with them, um, you know, over on the computer. Skype is a good way to do virtual office hours if you need to. I used to teach a class here on Skype before we went to Canvas. As long as you can see that person face to face. So the virtual office works are just the way of, you know, them stating that they have designated this time that is dedicated to them being at the computer. Right, if the students need to come to I just say, text me, call me. I think I'm available. Whatever y'all need. So have y'all ever texted me? Anybody in here texted me? Some of you have. I'm usually real good about answering the text. Mm -hmm. I usually have. So, But some people only check their emails once a day. And some instructors only check their emails once a day. Mine's always on. You know, it's just, it's it's just the preference. You know, could I stick to 10 hours a, a day, a week? Probably, if I really forced it, but I don't know. How would you get all of your work done? Maybe you make too much work for yourself, I don't know. But there's, um, 
pay at least one and a half times the regular rate if you work more than 40 hours. Does anybody work any place where they get overtime if they work over eight hours in a day? Because some places do. You know, they calculate it by the day. The work week is usually seven days or 168 hours period that can start at any time. Has that changed since last semester? Okay, so it's still the same. Um, that's almost poverty level, isn't it? If you think about not even working 40 hours a week, if you're just getting paid for the hours that you work, and they keep you at 30. So 7.25. The bi-weekly pay period, and again, I'm not going to test you on what those hours are or the percentages. Uh, my husband gets paid every other Friday. Two months out of the year, there are there's an extra Friday. I always tease him and I say, "Where did that extra check go this month?" Because he gets paid three times instead of two times. But those two months. Uh, <laughs> I think it's next month. Is it? So uh -oh, I'll have to ask you. <laughs> I never keep up with it. Uh, here's this came right out of your book. How you're going to calculate um, if you have overtime? Overtime is going to be 1.5 of uh, what the hourly rate is. So first of all, you'll have to calculate what, how many overtime hours that person has. And then you can either divide the hourly rate by two or multiply it by 1.5 to come up with what that overtime rate is. When you're working on the payroll register or on the employee's individual record, you might want to write down what their hourly rate is and also what their overtime rate is, so you're not calculating it over and over again. Right, so we have a lot of calculating that we have to do, but if you're good with numbers and good with working that calculator, don't try to do it on your own, don't try to do it in your head, um, you'll be able to calculate those hours and what you are work making. The withholding, several different taxes are taken out of the employee's gross pay, an employee has to fill out a W-4, the easiest way to remember that is before they can start working, they have to fill out the W-4 that tells you um, how many allowances you have. You can um, it lists your marital status. I list on mine that I'm single because it's a higher rate to have the amount taken out of your check. I just, I don't like to pay. I usually have the max taken out. You can have more taken out if you want every pay period, but don't use it as a savings account. Don't think on April 15th you want to get a big check back. Why let the government use your money? Try to calculate it so that it's, it's, it's real close to what you need to be paying for the year. I don't mind it except I, don't, I know I don't make enough. Oh, and you can do that. I mean, you just have to be smart about how you fill that out. I've never changed mine. I've just left it single, and I don't have any allowances on there. If you have dependents, you can claim those. If you have an elderly parent living with you, if you have, um, there's a disability on there, if you're blind, those types of things, you can... Uh, have an allowance for that. Just be smart about how you fill that out. And that's the W-4 that you have. If you're working, you fill that out, but they probably made a copy of your social security card. There's what it looks like. Okay. Um, The federal income tax withholding, withholding the amount, it's determined by the marital status, the number of allowances, 
your gross pay, the pay period. The wage bracket tables are in your book, and we'll use those. We'll have to look at whether they're single or married. Everybody in the first chapter, I think, is single. Everybody in the second chapter, everybody is married, so we have both of those forms. I'm giving you that form on the test. You'll just have to find the salary, how many allowances they have, and what that tax will be. That's the federal income tax. Uh, there's just a website, and that's in the PowerPoint if you want to go to that. Circulate E has a similar table for the married persons, but you'll see that when we get to the to the next chapter. They also have one for daily, weekly, monthly, semi-monthly, monthly, quarterly, and annual. So you can look at those forms. But there's kind of what it looks like. I like to use the main tent to follow all the way across um, so that you know what that withholding is going to be. Everybody's single here. It's bi-monthly. And let's say we made $115. All right, this is at least, but less than, so it's not here, we need to come down to this line, the 115. All right, so you've got to read what's at the top of those columns. And then let's say we had four allowances, so we come all the way across, and it was 664. It's tiny in your book. What page is it on? Does somebody have their book open? 365. Oh, 265. It's it's just very small. So it does help to use a straight edge to look across there. There's the one for the married people. And it is different. Same allowances up at the top. And again, at least but less than. So if we made 270, we'd have to come down to this one. At least 270 and not take this one from up here, less than 270. The state income tax, there are several states that do not have a state income tax. Texas is one of them, Florida is another. If you're taking a job in another state, you might ask if they have a state income tax because your take home pay is a little more. But you may be taxed on other things. When I lived in Virginia and then we moved here to Texas, I was amazed at how much our driver's license are, our license plates, because ours were very inexpensive in Virginia. But that's the way Texas is making some of its money, is through those license plates and, and your driver's license. So there are several states in 2008, uh, Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Washington, and Wyoming do not have state income tax. New Hampshire and Tennessee only impose taxes on interest and dividends, not on their I don't know. I don't know. I know Florida doesn't, and of course we don't, but I don't know about the others. We probably could just look it up and just Google what, tax, what states don't have a state income tax. Uh, you may have a city tax, you might have a county tax. It may be a percentage of the gross earnings, just like that federal income tax. So you can see if you're doing payroll, you have to know all of these laws as you're calculating what needs to be withheld. Uh, it may be a fixed dollar amount, so much uh, every pay period, um, and every county, every city, every state will have its own rules. So you've got, you'll become an expert if you're doing payroll in the state of Texas, but if you move to Florida, you might not be an expert there. You'd have to look at their tax, tax laws. And when you're an accountant, uh, it used to be just volumes of books every year. Um, and they were big books. And every week, it seemed like we would get new pages to put in the tax books. And that was our job to put in my dad's tax books, those papers that came in. If you got behind on filing, you still had to file those previous envelopes that came because it might tell you in the next envelope only to take out page 1,000 leave all of the other pages and replace page 1,000. 
now it's all computerized, so he has that on a computer now. He just gets those updates, and we don't have to file those papers anymore. And they were thin. They were like tissue paper, because it was just volume after volume of tax laws. Now he can just do a search, and he has to pay for that, but he can do a search if there's some kind of a tax law that he needs to look up. It's made it so much easier to have the, the computer and to have the database with all of that information in it. It'll make your job as a CPA much easier. Uh, when we talk about Social Security, Social Security came into effect in 1935. We call it FICA, FICA, Federal Insurance Contribution Act. It went into effect in 1937. Employers are required to withhold that amount from the employees' pay. And we have a FICA Social Security, and we have a FICA OESDI, the old age. Um, it's used to make the following payments, monthly retirement benefits. I don't know that it's still 62. I think that's changed. I think it has changed. Maybe it's 65. Medical, and again, I'm not going to test you on remembering those numbers. Medical benefits for persons over 65, benefits for persons that are disabled, um, benefits for families of deceased workers. Now, when I look at the withholdings from my check, it's unbelievable the amounts that are taken out. It's, it's a large amount. But I also think, um, with the Social Security, my grandmother lived to be 103, and she only worked for a short time after she graduated from high school until she got married. And after you got married back then, she was born in 1900, women did not work. So she never worked again. She did work. Oh, well, she did work outside the home. She did work, but she didn't work outside and earn any income. But she collected a monthly check until she died. So I feel like I'm paying for part of that now. She reaped all of those benefits from Social Security. And if she stopped working when she got married, she was 24. And that would have been 1924. What did we say it started? 1937. So she never paid into it. But she was able to collect it. Um, about 15 years ago, my brother's wife died and left two young children, very young children. And until they graduated from high school, they collected a Social Security check from Mary. You know, those children are now in their 30s. Um, you know, they collected for a long time, and she only worked for a short while. She had a stroke at a very young age. Um, and never woke up from had had another stroke right while she was unconscious. So what if you don't work? Because my mom told me that my mother's Korean and her aunt lives here. But she came here because her daughter came here. Her daughter invited her to live in the States, but she lived at a home and she had social security too, but she never worked. Okay. Is she collecting social security now? I don't know if it's social security, but she was collecting a check every month because she was in the home and everything. But she never worked. Did her, was she married? No. Okay, you can collect on your spouse's Social Security. That's why I was always confused. Yeah, things I'm have changed with the Social Security. They have to be vested in Social Security now, which is 40 quarters, and that's working for 10 years, paying into Social Security. So I'm not sure what she would be collecting. Because I know that my mom was complaining about that, so she was like, she's never contributed anything to the United States that she's collecting and she's surprised. See, I don't want to complain about that because I feel like I'm paying for what my my grandmother collected, what my grandfather collected, what my niece and nephew collected. My mother had ALS with Gehrig's disease and got that when she was 79. Medicare paid for all of her medical care and that is such an expensive disease. I don't know. I just, I don't, I, I say that it's a large amount that's taken out of my check, but I feel like my family has benefited from those services. 
But she, the thing is, I was just confused because she hasn't, I don't know how she's collecting anything. Because she came here when she was in the Rodeos, I think. I don't know. If, if you know her well enough, you might ask her what kind she of aspect it is. Oh, okay. I don't know. I haven't spoken. It's my mom's a lot. Oh. So it's been a while since. I think the last time I saw her. Well, then there's fraud that goes on. I'm not saying yeah. that your aunt was fraudulent in collecting that. But there's a lot of fraud that takes place, too. I think my mom said it's also because she was putting off uh, nursing rooms. Oh, maybe. So she collects the chat. Somebody's phone is ringing. I just turned it off. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. I just feel like my family has benefited so much. I'm sure you've got situations in your family where they have benefited too. Oh, oh, can you just turn it off? Okay. Thank you. Now, is it going to be around when you all get ready to collect Social Security at 65? I don't know, but I'm almost there. <laughs> So, if it's still 62, I only have two years to go. So, that'll be... <laughs> now, the age is very based on what you're born. I know. So, I think for you, it's still 62. But it's for, a, like, my generation, it's... It's probably it's higher like than that. Plus, it's also the day that you were born. My birthday is January 1st. And so, when I was born, my parents did not get the tax deduction. So, I think I do get to collect it a year early because it's January 1. So I'm getting, my dad was not happy that they missed that by a day. Because he could have claimed me for all year. Oh, no, no. I know. So maybe I'll get to collect it early. But, um, you know, sometimes the birthdays are very important. Um, my ex-husband and I have a child. He's not a child anymore, but we both carried insurance on him as he was growing up. And how they determined who was the primary insurance person was who's par the parent that had the first birthday in the year. So I was always the primary insurance carrier because my birthday was January 1st. So birthdays do come into effect with some things, and that's how they made that rule. He would be the primary insurance person was whoever had the earliest birthday in the year. So when we talk about Social Security, um, there's lots of benefits out there that you and your family members are entitled to. Again, it is investment right now. You have to be paid into it 40 quarters, 10 years. They don't have to be consecutive 40 quarters, but they have to be 40 quarters. If you're not sure how long you've worked, you can contact the Social Security and they'll tell you. One of the reasons I came to SAC uh, is that we take out Social Security here in Alamo Colleges. The school districts in the state of Texas do not pay Social Security. Now, if you have friends that work in the school districts, only San Antonio ISD pays Social Security. But the schools in Texas got a waiver years ago not to pay Social Security. So when do people figure out that they haven't been paying into Social Security? When they're getting ready to retire. Because I'm sure they don't look at their check at what's taken out. So if you're not working for San Antonio ISD, you're not paying Social Security. Well, here at Alamo Colleges, we pay Social Security and teacher retirement. In order for me to ever be able to collect on my husband's Social Security, if he dies before I do, I needed to have Social Security and TRS, the teacher retirement system, taken out of my check for five years. So I made the move to leave Northeast and to come here because I wanted to be able to collect on that Social Security if Tom died before I do. And before I came here, and I've been here now eight years, so we've passed that five-year mark, but we said, do we either worry about this or don't we worry about it? And we decided we would do something about it. So I took a drastic cut in pay to leave Northeast to come here, and but it was worth the move. Now I'm vested with his Social Security also because of those five years. If you have friends that are working in the school system and paying into TRS, 
you might ask them, do you know that you're not paying into Social Security? Why will the school districts not ever give up that waiver? Right. They, they have to match what they take out of my check. Alamo Colleges matches what I pay in Social Security every month. That's a lot of money for all of the employees. For the school districts to pick that up, they would have to match and pay what is taken out of each teacher's check for Social Security. That would be a massive expense for them. And I don't think they'll ever give up that waiver. Now in Northeast, they also were not paying Medicare, which they didn't have a waiver for that. And the people that were getting ready to retire with this rule um, had to do the back payment of all of the Medicare where they hadn't been paying into Medicare before they could retire. So it was really kind of a mess. I don't know whether the other districts weren't collecting the Medicare either, but I know Northeast was. Several of my friends that retired from there. Now there was a loophole um, before I left Northeast. If you were ready to retire, you could go to a school district that paid Social Security. And a lot of my friends that were ready to retire did that. They paid to go work at that school district for one day. And their last check had Social Security and TRS taken out of the check. And then they retired from that school district. They went and cleaned bathrooms. They put books on the shelves in the library. They did whatever that school district wanted them to do. Plus, they paid to go work there. Because they had to process their retirement from that school district. I wasn't old enough to retire, so I couldn't do it. But that loophole is gone. Now it's five years. So the TRS is the only thing that the Texas retirement system that we will get once they retire? Yes. They pay into that? Yes, they have to pay into that. Yeah. And the school district, they don't match that anymore, do they? No, not TRS. Yeah. So there's a lot of people, I'm sure, that are teaching that don't know that they're not paying into Social Security. Well, they just don't look at their pay stuff to see what's taken out. That should be like a big but you know what? I didn't realize it when I was there either until people were getting ready to retire and then they were going to the school district, these other school districts to work one day to collect Social Security. I already had my 40 quarters before I started teaching. So I didn't need any more quarters on Social Security. I'm paying into Social Security now, just paying more. But I did something else before I went into teaching. So I already had the 40 quarters. But that's 10 years of working with Social Security now. But could those laws change again? Yes. You know, that's why if you're working as an accountant, you'll have to keep up with all of those rules and regulations, and they change. The withholding for the Social Security taxes, and there are two, the OASDI and the Medicare. Okay, so we have OASDI, the old age, and survivors and disability insurance, and then the Medicare. Each one is calculated uh, separately and differently. OASDI puts a limit on the amount of tax that an employee must pay, and each problem will give you what that amount is. The Medicare, it's usually on all of the earnings, but it's a smaller percentage. This one, I think our book uses $7,000. So once the employee, I think, and see, I don't remember the numbers either. One of them has a wage base of $7,000, and it'll tell us in the problem what that is. Once the employee makes that much money, we don't have to calculate it again. Uh, here's just some percentages. I think this is in your book. 